A lot of people look for what product can I do to treat this instead of stepping back and saying holistically, what am I doing that is leading to these issues? What are those things that people are doing or is it our environment or things we're eating? I think they're making it too complicated. Think you have to exfoliate, think you have to peel, think you have to do all these things. It's actually shocking your skin. Well, Lauren, um, Dr. Landry and I are old friends now. We've been catching up on many things as you were getting your blood sugar under control. You, in the, in, the, in the four or five minutes we've been talking, I feel like we've already covered so much ground. I want to bring the audience up to speed. You have a very eclectic background that I think is, you know, normally we just kind of jump right into the subject matter of the show. But I think with you, we got to go back because you've done so many different things. You're in space, you're in food, you're in beauty, you're in skin. Let's just take it a step back. How do you de- how do you describe yourself and what you do at this point? So I'm a scientist at heart, um, but I also have the ability to connect the dots to bring things to reality that consumers and pe- people in general would just like. So my background, I'm a food scientist by training, bachelor's, master's, PhD. And from there, I hopped over to Harvard Med in the Department of Genetics, Longevity, uh, with David Sinclair. And we basically hit the ground running in all different avenues in longevity, beauty space, and also pharmaceutical development. So I've kind of touched a little bit. And didn't you say biodefense too? Yeah. So one of the first companies that came out was called Liberty Biosecurity. And the whole thing around that was how to mitigate uh, certain biological threats. And that was the first task that we were given. Uh, and David and I worked on some pretty cool technology. I can't talk about it too much, but, you know, we started there and then some of the technology spun out into the pharmaceutical world, specifically treatments for diabetic foot ulcers and wound care. And then that research led into the development um, of our cosmetic lines. Hold on. How are you and David Sinclair meeting in the first place? All right. So the story is actually pretty interesting. So I'll tell you, this is maybe 2004. 15, give or take. So I'm, you know, PhD student getting ready to graduate. I'm walking down the halls like a big shot and I get a phone call and I'm like, what is this Boston number? Like, and I was teaching at the time at Boston University and I still teach there now, but I was like, maybe it's something from BU. Let me answer it. And this guy's on the phone. He's like, Hey, is this Dr. Landry? And I'm like, yeah, you know, it's Kyle. What's going on? How can I help you? He's like, Hey, I'm David Sinclair from Harvard Medical School. I've read a few of your papers and you seem to be doing some crazy things and no one else is really doing this. Can I talk to you for a little bit? So, you know, we meet, we have some emails, we start collaborating. And then at the end, he's like, hey, do you want to come over and, you know, work in my lab and and kind of help jumpstart some of these projects around extremophiles? And extremophiles are basically my bread and butter and expertise with years of research. And these are organisms that survive in extreme environments. So high temperature, high pressure, um, low acidity, like, you know, low pH, um, thing, high acidity, I should say, but low pH, things like that. And how, you know, understanding how those organisms can survive and the mechanisms that they use um, to do that and how we can port them over for our benefit. So it's like biohacking. Per se, you know, we have these organisms that can survive in crazy, crazy environments. They've already figured it out with millions of years of evolution. So let's see if we can tease some stuff out of it. So, at this, did you know who who Sinclair was when nope. he reached out? Yeah, no idea. No idea. And, and for I, those that aren't listening, I mean, give a brief background on him because I, I know many of our listeners maybe know, but some probably have no clue. Yeah, David Sinclair is a very famous Harvard professor in longevity. Uh, his, you know, he discovered sirtuins. And those are the, the ancient DNA repair enzymes uh, that we have in our body that help repair DNA damage. He also discovered the properties of resveratrol. And then he's also famous for NAD boosters such as NMN and things of that nature. So he's, you know, he was also knighted by the uh, Australian government. So he's technically, you know, Sir David Sinclair. And you had no idea about this when he reached I out. had no idea who he was. And, you know, I'm a food scientist. Our paths don't cross. So I actually went down to my advisor's office And I was like, hey, I just had this crazy call from this guy from Harvard Medical School who wants, you know, to work with me and to go over there. So we Google him and she's like, are you serious? Like, this guy's like pretty famous, Time Magazine, all this stuff. And I was like, well, I guess so. So I guess I should go there. And I was like, so can I graduate? And she's like, just do a few more things and then, you know, we'll kick you over there. 
So what happens next? So from there, uh, we do some work on some enzymes and some really cool stuff. And uh, we end up filing a patent uh, for using novel enzymes from a fungus I discovered. And hold on, hold on. Novel enzymes from a fungus you discovered. What does that even mean? Explain that in layman's terms. <laughs> so I basically found an organism in the environment that no one else found. Okay. Wait, hold on. Wait, but where do you go to seek this organism out? Well, I can't really tell you those things. Imagine but you're talking to somebody that has no understanding of this kind of thing. So I guess let me, let me, let me think how I can phrase it. So or I've been to a lot of cool places. Uh, so I usually go to really cool places environments or strange, uh, strange places to look for organisms that have adapted to break down or produce things that could be beneficial. So, for example, you know, a lot of research go, researchers go to landfills to look and find organisms that can break down plastic, right? So if you have an organism that's living and thriving in a landfill and the only carbon source or, you know, majority of carbon sources there is plastic, there's a good chance, you know, it could break it down. So there's a lot of researchers looking on ways to recycle plastic using novel enzymes from organisms. But I was looking at them for DNA repair um, mechanisms and machineries because I looked at organisms uh, that focused, you know, that grew exclusively in high temperature environments. So high temperature environments usually accelerate DNA damage and mutations. So somehow these organisms can live at 130, 140 degrees Fahrenheit and not mutate like, you know, at high rates. So we we're looking at how can we repair or how do these organisms repair themselves? And that kind of led me into David's world because I purified and isolated a few enzymes that was of, it, of interest for David. What's something that you learned from him and what's something that he learned from you? All right. So I learned everything I know about longevity. So I came from a background where, you know, I'm talking about bean sprouts and meats and, you know, carbohydrates and things like that, you know, designing food. And David, you know, educated me on longevity at the molecular level. You know, we're not talking superficial level. We're talking at cell metabolism, cell resets, epigenetics, things that really uh, impact your physiological age, not necessarily your chronological age, right? So you have two ages. You have the chronological age, which is how long you've been around. Then you have your actual physical age, which is how your body has been aging. And most people don't realize this, but you can manipulate your body's aging. And we do this all the time in the, in the produce world with apples and tomatoes, right? Those are picked super early, and they're kind of put in this suspended animation in a refrigerated car for months and months and months. And yet they go on the store shelf six months later, and they're at the same physiological age as they were, maybe a little older than, you know, well, even though the chronological age is months older. What is something that would blow our mind about longevity? Like something that you think is not talked about enough? So there are, you know, longevity is like a, a double-edged sword, right? Like you have the issues where if you extend population where they live to 150 years old, is that sustainable in our current finite space? And then you have my aspect or my thought process on longevity where it's not necessarily extending your age, but it is extending the quality of life. So, Like health span versus lifespan. Yeah, so you'll be functional till you're 78, 79 and only have a few years of, you know, decline instead of, you know, living to 68, 69. Then you start to decline and you end up staying in... Um, hospital care or something for 10, 20 years, which is not a good quality of life. So longevity should be looked at extending your functional age where you can actually do things, be beneficial in, in, in for society and get stuff done instead of just looking at living to, you know, 150. Like it's okay old. to live to 90, but you don't want to live to 90 if you lose your function at 60. Yeah, I and wouldn't. How yeah. do we do that? How do we, how do we live with a quality of life after a certain age? Well, there's, you know, where the longevity space is interesting because people look at it at all different levels, right? So some people look at it at the cellular level where other people look at the topical vis visible, you know, application. Oh, you look young. Your skin looks young. And it may look young, but your organs may be, you know, trash depending on your lifestyle. So when you look at different things, it's all about how you basically what you do, like your everyday actions, 
your exposures to things, your habits, all impact your your ability to, you know, it's your longevity aspect. Makes sense. So you're saying like really being being thoughtful about your environment, where you're living, how you're living, what you eat. Give us what like you do. really specific ones. Uh, so, you know, obviously, uh, as a food scientist, I'll jump right into fast food, for example, right? So everyone has this stigma with fast food. Oh, it's bad, high process, this and that. It is, if you eat it every day. You can think about the documentaries that have been around that showed that. But if you eat it in moderation, it's not going to have a detrimental impact. So whenever I talk to people, even in my class, I, I talk about I say, you know, you shouldn't say, I'm not going to do this, I'm not going to do this, I'm not going to do that. Just say, I'm going to be mindful in what my choices are. And if I have to have a burger, you know, it's not going to be the end of me. Just I can't have a burger three times a day for, you know, a month and not expect to have any repercussions on, on your body. So me walking out in the waiting room eating Cheez-Its is okay because my blood sugar was low and I felt like I needed something right away. But if yeah. I'm eating Cheez-Its all day long, it's not the move. Yeah, I would not eat Cheez-Its, chips, Pringles, or anything all day. Uh, but, you know, have moderation, and it's it's perfectly fine. And even, like, environmental impacts, you know, affect your skin and all these other things, which most people don't realize until it's too late. So that's another area. What's your opinion on meat eaters, vegan, or does it not matter? Like, what what do, what is your vibe personally, your own take? My, my personal take yeah. is, again, moderation. Um, you know, our bodies have evolved over the, the years to, you know, be able to take both in. But if you are heavy on one or heavy on the other, you know, there are implications. That's why moderation is key. And some people do it for environmental reasons, right? Um, other people do it for health reasons, heart conditions, things of that nature. Um, I personally, you know, I like meat and I like, I'll go and eat a bean burger at the same time. I'm not uh, biased one or the other. It's just moderation. It's, it's simple. It's like the simplest explanation, but it's the hardest thing for people to do. What about exercise? Exercise is great. Like back in the day, yeah, we died at 20 and 30 from disease and being eaten by, you know, wolverines and stuff like that. <laughs> but our bodies are designed to move, right? We have the ability to adapt and, and, and grow and change our bodies through physical exercise. But right now we live in a society where we're sedentary, right? All of our jobs are sedentary. Even agricultural jobs, it's still manual labor, but a lot of it's automated with machines. So our bodies have not evolved to um, a sedentary lifestyle and also eating, you know, um, highly processed or easy to digest foods, which is like a double-edged sword because we want it to, for convenience factors, but our body also wants to absorb as much as possible because that's what it's designed to do, right? It, back in the day, we were in caves. We didn't know what our next meal was. So our body is designed to just absorb as much as we can, which leads to issues down the road. So when you start working with him in, in his lab and in his environment, what are the things that you guys, like, what are the, what do you, what do you first start doing? And, and what are the wins that you guys start putting on the board? Yeah. So I started uh, working with the fungus to, to purify some, de uh, some enzymes and that led to a patent. So that's the first win. I wasn't really involved with the other projects he was working on. I was mostly involved with this one. And, you know, this ended up spinning out into a company. And, um, you know, we carried on for quite some time and we had, you know, great contracts. We, we did some really cool science. So that's a great win, right? You know, taking technology that I never thought would honestly go anywhere, right? I thought it was an academic exercise and now bringing it um, full circle to something that could be used is game changing in my mind. I never thought I'd be doing that. What is the process of creating this because it says certified space technology. Oh. Like, what does that even mean? Yeah. So this this serum, I'll, I'll this, this cosmetic company, De La Vie Sciences, was created in January last year, and it was where we ported out all some technology from other companies that we had into this um, product. And 
the the idea was, you know, we have these efficacious, innovative ingredients that no one else has. Let's bring them to the public right away so people can benefit from them. So this actually fell out of some work we were doing with um, the Jet Propulsion Lab. So we were doing some um, subcontract work with them for some research, and they happened to have an organism that was researched on the space station. So it was sent up to the International Space Station, put outside of the space station for 18 months, and then brought back down to Earth and was basically shelved in the uh, repository for years. So when I was working with them, they were like, hey, we have this really cool organism. We know you're into extremophiles. Do you want to see, you know, what it can do? So this thing survived in outer space? Yeah, yeah. For that long? Yep. And, and then just got brought back down to... Yeah, it happens all the time. The hell is going on? These <laughs> organisms. <laughs> so Aliens are real. They're here. So what, so what we, you know, being in the longevity space, Dave and I were like, let's see what longevity attributes this has because obviously if it can withstand cosmic radiation if it can withstand all these things it must have some pretty cool properties that maybe we could leverage so when we started working with it um the first thing we noticed for this application was it activated sirtuins which are dna repair enzymes resveratrol activates sirtuins exercise does this so these are enzymes that help repair dna damage they're activated during fasting and all these other things that help in their link to longevity and lifespan. The second thing we noticed is that it actually stimulates your cell's ability to produce hyaluronic acid. So hyaluronic acid is something everyone loves, but most products, if not all of them, are topical based. So you put them on your skin, you hope they absorb, and you hope they do something. Uh, the bacillus lysate that's in here actually helps the efficacy of your cells. So your cells start producing it naturally. You're producing your own hyaluronic acid. So that's going to be more efficacious than something you hope absorbs through your skin. And then finally, you know, one of the things that we realize is that it actually uh, blocks free radicals that are formed from UV exposure. So think about it. You're in space. You're being bombarded by all this radiation, UV radiation from the sun, cosmic radiation that can be producing free radicals and free radicals damage things. Well, the organism had something that helped block and prevent free radicals from forming. So in the serum, the besides hyaluronic acid, be, besides D, uh, DNA repair enzymes, it actually will quench radicals formed from sun exposure. So it's kind of like a trifecta, right? You're in the sun, you're getting sun damage from free radicals. You know, this stops it. One, it helps with a hyaluronic acid, which is hydration and plumping. And then two, it turns on DNA enzymes that repair any damaged DNA. This sounds very disruptive to the skincare industry. Yeah, so De La Vie Science's whole background, the, the whole idea is to create innovative, unique ingredients. Most cosmetics are just repackaged things that you can buy from a distributor, right? You buy hyaluronic acid, it's the same hyaluronic acid in all the different products. Here we have patented proprietary ingredients that no one else has that have, you know, killer credentials that, that go with it. So this is just the first uh, product. We have an eye cream that just launched. It sold out in three hours after it was launched. And we have another, the next production batch. Uh, that's actually going on sale next week, believe it or not. So I have a question with them I mean, yeah. because you guys are such researchers and obviously scientists with all this access to all this incredible information. The everyday person mistakes they're making with their skin. And the reason we see such a decline in, you know, nice skin, like what, what are those things that people are doing or is it our environment or things we're eating? I think they're making it too complicated, right? Using six, seven, eight different products, right? Thinking you have to exfoliate, think you have to peel, think you have to do all these things. It's actually shocking you know, your skin, right? So I'm in the mindset and I may be, you know, on outside a little bit, but if you give your skin what it needs, you can use one or two products and have some of the best skin in your life, right? Your, your skin obviously is missing something, whether it's moisture, hydration, you know, um, certain active compounds, you just have to find the right one that does it. So when we design products, we look at how can we improve the efficacy 
of your skin cells and make them more efficient, not how can we hide them or fill the wrinkles or temporarily, you know, hide the, the problems. We're looking to, you know, repair it and bring it back to a more uh, youthful state. What about collagen repair? Yeah. So this product, um, you know, the collagen production and enhancement in here is, is not the main focus of the serum. But the eye cream, for example, looks at collagen around the eyes to help with firmness and, and wrinkles and fine lines and things of that nature. Collagen production is very important, and repairing the collagen matrix is one of the key things you can do. Unfortunately, just adding hydrolyzed collagen to your face will not necessarily be the answer. So we're actually looking and developing ingredients with a main focus of improving your collagen production naturally. So your internal collagen, not just some extraneous collagen you hope does something. What are your thoughts on Botox and filler as, as a scientist? You know, they have their place, right? Not everything can be done with uh, serums and creams, right? Botox and fillers, they've been around forever. Some people like them. Some people don't like them. I know there's a big pro-age movement going on now where it's not necessarily bad to age and people are accepting aging, but they want their skin to be as healthy as possible during the aging process. So it comes down to preference, basically. What are some preventative things that we can be doing to keep our skin looking plump and oh, juicy? Plump and juicy. <laughs> So that's uh, good. So one, use sunscreen, right? Sun is the main damaging you know, factor to your skin. And what's sad and most people don't realize is that the, the damage you get in your late teens, early 20s will catch up to you later on. So being proactive and preventing or trying to minimize that damage as young as you can is going to help you look better later on in life, right? So being proactive with sunscreen, using a great moisturizer to, to help maintain and lock it in, and also just a diet, right? So drink a lot of water, fruits and vegetables, stay away from greasy foods that can lead to greasy skin, things of that nature. It's, again, moderation, kind of common sense, um, but a lot of people look for what product can I do to treat this instead of stepping back and saying, holistically, what am I doing? that is leading to these issues. Now, some people you can't fix, right? They just have abnormalities or they have problems with their skin and it's a condition and they have to go down the path. But most people, they should just say, what are we doing? What am I eating? What's, how much am I in the sun? How often am I in the sun? What, what's going on? And, and try to adjust it that way. As a food scientist, are there things that people think are healthy that you think are, are not so healthy for the skin or the body? Like I know for a while everybody was all excited about kale and now people are saying maybe they don't like kale as much. I don't know if you agree with that or not. <sighs> I mean, the problem with food is it's all, there's a lot of trends linked to it. If you break it down to the nutrients and the nutritional value, I mean, it's pretty set in stone what's what. Again, it's all about moderation. If you eat a lot of carrots, you know, you may notice a change in your skin pigmentation. If you eat a lot of kale, you may notice a change in your gut and how you feel. Um, I don't want to say it's one thing or the other, but generally greasy foods lead to uh, just skin complications because the oil has to come out and it, it can help increase that. Uh, but in general, you know, just moderation. It's, I'm going to keep saying that over and over again, but again, it's the hardest thing to do. How do you study skin as a scientist? Like, what does this look like? Are you in a lab? Are you in a coat? Yeah. What do you look? Are you? In, so, I want to. Well, I want to understand this because when I think of a scientist, like I think of the emoji with the beaker. Oh is yeah, that that's what, true. Is this, what, what, am I picturing this right? Yeah. So we have uh, an eight thousand square foot research facility where we one look for novel ingredients. So the the process is this. Okay, we find some really cool things that live in some really cool environments. Um, I was telling you earlier how I went 5,000 feet below the surface of the earth in an abandoned gold mine to look for organisms that could withstand high uh, redox and, and very hostile environments. So we know it comes from somewhere, right? It's like, okay, how can we tease out a functional component? So literally it's people in lab coats doing research, trying to extract things from these organisms and, you know, doing tissue culture cell, uh, studies in vitro studies, you know, enzyme assays, and we build up enough data to say, okay, 
you know, we think this has a good shot of actually being efficacious based on these, you know, standard scientific studies. And then we start going into more skincare-based studies, right? So you can have, you know, ex vivo studies or, or simulated skin, and you can look at penetration, you can look how it impacts plumpness, collagen, elastin, all of these different things, hyaluronic acid. And then we see that, and then we go, okay, let's go now into clinical studies with our formulations, and then we go and we do uh, large clinical studies with human subjects, and we measure a whole bunch of different things. What's something that's bullshit that you've discovered being a scientist? Because you're you're coming from a position of facts. What's something that you hear a lot that you think's bullshit? So there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff around. You know, um, this ingredient has been shown to do this in a test tube, but there's no clinical evidence that it actually does anything. What is clinical evidence? Can you expand on that? Yeah, so uh, a clinical study in the cosmetic world is where you have a panel of people, usually a minimum 30 to 35 people, uh, and it can go up as high as you want, and you give them the ingredient and the product under very strict controlled uh, parameters, and you do empirical measurements over time. So, for example, you could use a glossimeter, which is an instrument that measures skin gloss and radiance, you can use a Novometer, a cutometer. These things measure uh, hydration and moisture. They measure firmness, elasticity. And then you can go all the way to expert grading and uh, before and after photos. And then if you want to go uh, a level below that, I, I say below, but basically looking at mechanism of action, you can look at um, upregulation or deregulation of genes that are linked to a whole bunch of different things. So you basically build the case in the lab, then you build the case in tissue cultures and in gene expression, and then you have the final uh, empirical evidence done with human subjects, and you connect the dots that way. You know, you're not going to do gene expression on people in, in the clinical study, but if you have a clinical outcome from the human studies and then you have the gene expression and tissue culture studies that substantiate the findings, you know, you have strong correlation between the evidence. At dinner parties, do people ask you a bunch of questions about this? They ask me. It depends. It could be food. I've always, I'm on the record. I'll be on the record here. I usually destroy food for people. They usually ask me. Like what is something you destroy? Uh, I don't know. I, I, like, I always explain the process of how things are done or, or what is done, and they're like, oh, you just ruined it for Give me. Give something that, like, you ruin for a lot of people. And ruin it for us. What about Cheez-Its? Cheez-Its are on the table. Cheez-Its are, Cheez -Its are a, a great snack. But a oh, lot wow. of things, like one, one example um, is I was at a dinner party and there was someone who was vegan or veg vegetarian, I can't remember, and we were drinking a wine and it wasn't a vegan wine, it was a vegetarian wine. And I was telling them, I said, you know, there's probably animal products in there. And they're like, no, no, there's none of that in there. I said, listen, they use gelatin or they use egg albumin to pull out the uh, bitter compounds in wine, and it's not necessarily on the label. And then this blew, this blew the person's mind. Isn't there like fish, fish bladder sometimes too in some of the stuff? I, I don't know about that, but wherever the proteins come from, it could be, you know, gelatin or eggs or even synthetic proteins. And why we had um, the founder of Dry Farm Wines on here, and he was saying, like, the wine companies don't have to disclose they that. They don't because it's in such a small amount. So, you know, whenever I, I talk about that, if people ask of it, and they'll be like, oh, my God, I didn't know. A lot uh, of vegans are going to maybe what, switch back. They what foods that wine. you've seen are high in heavy metals? Heavy metals, I mean, not really any here in the United States because it's uh, monitored. P people monitor for that. If people find heavy metals, it could be in produce and stuff like that from the grounds. Um, but normally, you know, in the United States, we're very privileged to have, you know, strict food requirements and guidelines. The, the USDA does a great job ensuring this. And the, the food supply is very safe and very stable here in the U.S. And I feel like people tend to take that for granted. You know, you can go to the market at any time and find strawberries year-round when it's a seasonal fruit, right? Um, so heavy metals, I mean, people usually are probing for them, you know, watchdogs or something like that to cause a point. But the, the food's safe. In the Do you know what? 
Triclosan is T R I C L O S A N. Is that what is that in the soap? Yeah. Yeah, the antibacterial and soap. Oh my God, I can't believe you knew that. Well, I'm a it's microbiologist. So I know, but I mean, it's just random. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, of course, I'm going to ask you this, but it just is a random thing. Yeah. I got my blood tested and it said my levels of that are off the chart. But what's weird is it's found, it, like you just said, in soap. And I'm pretty specific about the products that I use. And it's also found in toothpaste, but I use a toothpaste that doesn't have it in it. There's got to be some kind of product. Do you think there's, do you think there's anything that, that off the top of your head that you would think of for me to avoid? No, no. I mean, it's a pretty standard antimicrobial in, in a lot of soaps and, and stuff like that. It's, I, can't, I can't help you with that one. But. I don't know what soap that it would be. But I was all we so we just had the head of the EWG um, Ken Cook on the show. Yeah, he was yeah. here yesterday, and we were talking about these things. And he was like, "Well, like, a lot of this stuff has a very short half life if you just eliminate it from your system." Because like, we hear all the time heavy metals and all yeah, this yeah. stuff, but from a scientific perspective, like how how easily can your body detoxify from some of these things if you discontinued use or consumption? Yeah, so that's all dependent on the compound, right? And you have various depots in your body. You you know, if it's a a fat soluble compound it's going to be in the adipose tissue or going to different body, uh, parts but they test all these things you know there, there's studies on this and if you're very specific if you're looking for something you can generally find something right and then depending on how big you want to blow it out of proportion it, it's up to you but think about it we've been around forever well, not forever but in oh, our, a long time a very yeah. long time and you know our body's been exposed to so many different things we fight off um, infectious disease all the time. You know, we eat all different things. Our body's pretty good at getting rid of certain things. Now, some things like aflatoxin, for example, uh, which uh, could be found in peanut butter and stuff like that, our body's not necessarily that good at getting rid of that. And chronic low dose exposure of those types of things are issues. But, you know, the with safety testing and you know, what the industry does now, again, it's moderation and just being aware. And if you want to make specific choices, do certain things, it's it's perfectly fine. With what you do, what has been the craziest finding? Like that you remember being in the lab where you were like, holy shit. So I have to say the bacillus lysate that's in the, the serum because this was just something shot out of the dark. We were just like, let's just see, you know, we're doing all this other stuff. Let's look at the application, longevity aspects, and it worked well. Um, it, and we were like, let's bring it right to market. Yeah, let people start using it, see, see how it goes. And then the second one, uh, is this other ingredient we're developing now, which is a bunch of enzymes that, you know, will help break down, um, uh, plugged pores, help exfoliate your skin. That's another great thing that we just happened to discover from a crazy backstory. Uh, this one came from me going to a secret location I can't disclose, but putting my hand in a pile of something that most people wouldn't put their hands in. What does the secret location rhyme with? Uh, <laughs> I'll say barn. Barn. Hmm. Maybe yarn. that's a bad one. I don't know. We'll see. Yarn? When you... when I when Wait, he has to tell us okay, what he okay. discovered. Hold on. So, yeah, so this came from these enzymes. They're new to science, and... And they have great activity. Um, and that's coming out in our next line. Um, that will be a face cleansers and stuff to help improve the efficacy of the serum. When you talk about spelunkering around here, is that the word spelunking? Around well, for cave, these, diving. cave diving? Cave yeah. diving. That is right, cave diving. Um, yeah. For these microorganisms, like, uh, is this like a moss? Is this like a fungus? Is this mushrooms? Like, what are the, what are the, how do you even identify what a microorganism looks like? I imagine you down there in some crazy spacesuit with a light on your head looking. That's pretty close. I'll show you pictures after. Yeah. And so, are you, like, how do you identify, like, oh, there's an organism? Like, what, did, what, like, what are they? Are they a fungus? Yeah. Are I they think, imagine, like, you're talking a to moss? a kindergartner because I don't even know what it, like, looks like. So, every, I imagine it like a sperm. A everything I deal with is invisible. Oh. So, so you're just taking samples. So it's not a sperm. sperm. No. A sperm's not invisible. <laughs> well, a sperm is, <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> but, um, yeah, we, we go and we swab, collect samples. We isolate the organisms, and then we look at their attributes for application. So you're going into stuff in, in these environments that, you know, no other kind of organism or, you know, 
animal or human or mammal can survive in, in these environments? Well, no, they do because they're there. Okay. So like the fungus, for example, that the enzyme came out of, it was growing at 130 degrees Fahrenheit. That's pretty warm. And it thrives there. It's happy. It's, it's great. I wouldn't want to be hanging out there. For, and when you take it out, it doesn't die or get irritated? Well, you, you store it and you collect it and then you try to grow it in those same environments. environments again. Yeah, And that's oh. what we do in the lab. Is there any random things that you've found that should not be heated up at all? Well, there are organisms that only live in cold environments called psychrophiles. They grow at like zero to four degrees, eh, maybe four degrees centigrade, so refrigeration temperatures. So they wouldn't thrive in any other nope, temperature? No, nope. even room temperature they would die. There's also organisms that are sensitive to oxygen or they're aerotolerant, where it means they could take some, but they usually can't. And those you have to grow in special environments. This is random, but do you? What do you think, as a scientist perspective, of the hyperbaric chamber? It it has its function. It's it it's it's good. Like for healing. So for healing, you know, it depends what you're doing. You know, exercise, all these different things in there. Okay, it it, it has its function for healing. I can't really comment too much on that. What about does is anything that you don't like about it? No, I mean. I don't like being in one, and I don't, and I don't like being in like a, a de, like the salt tanks or stuff like that where you know complete isolation. Have you ever been? Yeah. In one of those. Yeah. My mind ends up racing a thousand miles per hour, and I end up you know going down rabbit holes. I don't want to go. I think down. you either love it or you hate it. Yeah. I would love it, but it fucks up my hair. So it's just it's just too much of a process that's... to blow. You know what I mean? It's like, oh fuck, I gotta wash yeah. my hair. So that's why I. But I like it. You, I think it's good if you have a really, really. I like it once in a while, but I'm probably similar to you. Busy I'm brain, it's but racing, it... racing. Yeah. Um, when it comes to the skincare industry, yeah. What are things that you think, and you don't have to name any competitors. Yeah. People are doing right, and things that you wish they would do better. So. I think the trend of having people be comfortable with who they are and just trying to enhance their themselves is a great trend, right? Uh, we shouldn't be trying to make everyone look like something that's unattainable, right? People should be comfortable and happy with who they are and just try to find products that elevate themselves to, you know, to the most efficient and in level that they want to be in, right? It's don't try to hide it. Don't try to change it. I mean, some people want to and some people do. That's fine. Um, but for the vast majority of people, I feel like they just want something that works and helps them be, you know, their skin to be as healthy as possible. And that type of trend and change is very positive for the industry. What From about a scientist's perspective? How much stuff on, on the market's bullshit? Is there a lot of bullshit? I mean, I think we, I think it's, it's safe to say most cosmetic products do not have any clinical studies associated with them. So, you know, they're basing the efficacy on the individual ingredients, not on the overall product and what it can do. So, like, if there's hyaluronic acid in somebody's product, they're basing this, they're basing, not the success, but they're the efficacy of that product on the hyaluronic acid that's in there as an ingredient because mm -hmm. that has the clinical studies, not that actual product that it may be in. Yeah. What you're and you'll notice this because you'll go to stores and you'll see products that say, you know, uh, contains vitamin C antioxidant, right? They they probably haven't tested the actual product for antioxidant potential, but they know that vitamin C is an antioxidant and it's in there. But then you'll find brands that say, you know, 90% of the subjects found their skin was smoother and, you know, more firm after application. Then you'll see an asterisk and it'll say, you know, from a 28-day clinical study. Those are hard to find. You know, just go into a store and look. And, and look at the marketing and look at the claims. So like our position as scientists with our products is, you know, we're scientists first and we want to be, you know, data driven and science backed. So we want to develop the ingredients, show they're efficacious, and then show our products that contain them are efficacious and not just base it on studies that may not correlate directly to skincare. Because you're a scientist and you have access to Dr. Sinclair, mm -hmm. What are the supplements that you guys like? And oh. I would love to know brands because people are going to ask. I don't know if I if I can comment on those, but um, you know, just a general vitamin is, is good. A multivitamin. There's a lot of people who take NAD boosters. There's a lot of people who take fish oil, resveratrol, a whole bunch of different things like that. Are you an NAD lover? Uh, 
NAD, no. I mean, I do take um, some supplements that help uh, boost NAD. Didn't they just remove NMN? Yeah, that's uh, that's a dicey topic because um, it's going through clinical trials right now as a, as a drug. So they they the FDA kind of slapped it down because of some bio uh, laws and regulations that go with drug development. I don't know if Sinclair's going to like that. <laughs> so <laughs> no. many people that that uh, high performers in Austin are doing NAD. Mm-hmm. Can you explain exactly to the audience what it I is? I do NAD. Michael does so, NAD. like, NAD is needed for your body, right? All the functions, you know, without it, you would die within a second or For your so. mitochondrial Yeah, function. yeah, you, you need that. So supplementing NAD or boosting it in your body will help keep them at high levels so your body can perform, especially if you're a high, uh, you know, a high performer or an athlete where you're constantly straining your body. It's always good to have that supplement there. So some supplements are precursors. And if you do, you know, drips or IVs, you're getting the straight stuff in there. Now, whether, you know, it actually has a long-term effect or if it goes to your liver and gets processed, that's a whole other story. Um, but in general, you know, it, it's just like carbo-loading, right? The point is, you know, you, you build up your glycogen, you get ready so you can burn it for marathons and running. It's a similar practice, just a different way to look at it. So... Why does NAD make you feel like, and I've never done it, this is what I hear, you have to shit your pants. It doesn't make I've, you feel like I've, that. I've never experienced that. I've, Lord, I don't know. You're so funny. You and Weston told they, him and his no, best no, friend. No, it doesn't. It's an indescribable feeling of someone, for somebody who hasn't done it, I, I personally feel. And I've done a, I've done a lot of it. Yeah. Um, or not a lot of it, but I've done it you know, consistently for about a year or two, like m- monthly, every other, maybe sometimes every other month. Um, Kind of now at this point, not as much, but when I feel like I just want a little boost or whatever. Yeah. It doesn't make you feel like you're going to shit yourself. It's not, it's just a weird, queasy feeling with the drip. Um, and sometimes it's uncomfortable. Sometimes you can feel congested in your face. I don't know if you know the reasons no, why. I don't. <laughs> I've it, never done a drip. I've never done anything like that, so I can't. But as soon as it's done, it's gone. I, the, the thing, I'm such an experimental person, but... I'm so petrified of needles and to have a needle in me that makes me want to shit my pants. I mean, that's... I, it doesn't, make, doesn't I, sound fun I mean, to me. some people may like that. I don't know. It doesn't make you feel like you shit your pants. Or I'm trying queasy, to tell you. Or queasy, queasy. Um, it is... Str- yeah, I think it's worth it for if you have access to try it one time and see how you feel after. Weston said he felt... My friend said he felt amazing, total clarity, energy, um, like life-changing. Well, it makes sense if it's the fuel for the mitochondria and all these other things. But is it sustainable? You know, how long does it last? Is it is it like yeah. a cup uh, of coffee right. where it's gone after a little huh. bit and is like, you know, is it, is it worth doing, you know? That's the question. Because what I like, so for example, if I have heavy presentations or board meetings or things, you know, things that I got to, you know, be a little bit more on point for, I like it kind of before then because for that like week or two, I feel like that limit, limitless drug, you know, like that, mm-hmm. you watch that yeah. show. but. I think you're right. I think like how long does that last? How often do you need to do it? And that's where lifestyle comes into play, right? Like chronic exercising, eating good foods, getting sleep. You will get that clarity. You'll get those benefits if you change your lifestyle, right? And and you're, you're focused on that type of thing. And that will be, you know, in my mind, having a long-term lifestyle change for the better is more impactful than trying to, you know, patch a Band-Aid on something just just to get it going. So how do you, so if you were going to coach someone on, on where to start with the serum or how to use this serum, yeah. man, woman, how do you suggest they start? And how do you pronounce a- Aonia? A- Aonia, yeah, oh, okay. which is everlasting, uh, forever beautiful type of play. And so, you know, the serum is, is just straightforward. You use like any other serum. Um, you put it on after you wash your face or whenever you want, morning and night. And then during the day, you can seal it after with a moisturizer or a sunscreen. And at night, just put it on and, and let it do its work. You know, the serum is the first of four products that are coming out. So the Eye Refresh that launched in April that sold out in three hours is designed to be used in the morning to help uh, remove fine lines, wrinkles, under um, bagging, uh, under eye bags. Why did it the, sell out in three hours? Like what, what was the the thing about it like the secret serum so I, feel like. I think you know i think what people are discovering from using the serum and you know we're not is that it works and the bacillus lysate which can't be found in any other formulation or any other product anywhere because you guys have the patent we have the patent we manufacture it we own it 
you know, the attributes that it has and that we've tested and showed are what people are noticing. Right? So They're what? Ch- who have you heard from that's like obsessed with it? So we've heard from people from, you know, some celebrities who've been using all the way to just people who are DMing us or leaving testimonies on various apps. Uh, we have, you know, magazine editors who've tried it and are blown away by it. Um, and, you know, so we're like, OK, now we have the eye cream and, you know, finding a good eye cream is very hard for people. Apparently that it's impossible. It's impossible. Because you know why? Why? They cause milia. The little white dots yeah, little white under dots, the eyes, yeah. that is why. It's because when people sweat, mm-hmm. it produces milia. Yeah, then they can't shed the skin that yes, comes out. that's why yep. an eye cream, you do not want to fuck around with an eye cream, in my opinion. <laughs> so so that would be a good one. So what's great is, you know, by improving the, e- the efficacy and efficiency of your cells naturally with the bacillus lysate, uh, you know, the results from the clinical studies, you know, over, I think I... I think 100% of the people who used it, I know for the serum, 100% of the people who used it love the texture and would recommend it to, to their friends and add it to their... So this is like a superior serum and eye cream. And you think it's because of the bacillus lysate? Did oh, I say, yeah. Did yeah. I say that right? Yeah, bacillus lysate. There yeah, so the ingredient, you know, does wonders. So now we put it in eye cream. The next eye cream that's coming out in the around the end of the year is an overnight eye repair cream. So heavy moisturizer it has some other things like ceramides and I need that. and things in there, and that's really to hydrate um, your eyes overnight. Some retinol in there, so you don't you know want to stay out you want to stay out of the sun. And then the final product would be a general face moisturizer that you use. So the whole concept here is you're using products that are improving the efficiency, um, you know, with antioxidants and enzyme activation and hyaluronic acid. So it's not just masking, hiding, or covering; it's actually impacting that. So I just, my brain, when you tell me that, that this is from space. Well, it's not from space. It was studied in space. It came from Earth originally. Okay, that's what I wanted to ask. But it survived in space. I'm wondering, like, is an astronaut bringing this down from space to you? That's not what that is. No, no. So, so, you (laughs) know. If you could see my brain right now. No, an astronaut was not, like, holding it in his pocket, and he got out of the capsule, was like, here you go. Okay. You could take it. Okay. You know, it was part of a research program that was done by Planetary Protection, basically to see how extreme organisms can survive and if they could withstand the vacuum of space, right? And so they sent it up there, they put it outside, and then they shot it back down on a module. And NASA scientists researched it. Um, they published some papers on it, and they basically shelved it until I was, you know, working with them on some things. And they were like, hey, you know, you seem to be interested in extremophiles. Can you do anything with this organism? Because, you know, it's, it's pretty cool. So we took it and we worked on it for almost two years. Um, you know, we, we changed it up. We, we learned what it did and we created the ingredient and then you know, figured out what we could do with it. And for those critics out there in the audience that are sitting there screaming, saying we should ask smarter questions, you come on and interview a scientist that's doing <laughs> salag bites and salag tights and skalunkling and moving up and down in space and bringing these random microorganism ingredients. This is a lot. This is it's a lot to level. digest. No, yeah. it is high level. I mean, yeah, it's very high level, and uh, it you know, there's so many things that you know, like I said, our company is focused on creating really effective ingredients driven by science. And that's very hard to find. And Uh, and in some cases, some science that that you guys are discovering now. Discovering, and some that, you know, we've patented or we licensed that were for other applications that we were like, okay, we want to see how it works in these applications. And we're always discovering new ingredients. We have, like I said, the enzyme is one. And then we have another protein that we just submitted a patent on uh, that actually protects your cells from um, stress, like salt stress, environmental stress, stress from pollutants. So it's called osmotic stress protection factor, and it increases cell viability and minimizes the impact of everyday stresses that you will experience. I wanted to have you on because I think it's so incredible to talk about the science behind the skincare. Yeah. So many times I have skincare experts on or facialists or estheticians, but it's fun to also hear the science side of it. I don't know if I can trust anyone that hasn't gotten a microorganism from space anymore, Lynn. 
<laughs> you might have, you might have ruined all these. You could use the eye cream. He could use the eye cream. Can you guys send? I know it's sold out, but can we yeah, try well, to find come, a bottle? I'm yeah, gonna say open. next time one of these dopes comes on and say, "Listen, Doctor Kyle came on and he got his <laughs> from space. Where are you getting yours from?" Oh yeah, we got we got a bunch of other stuff cooking too that's coming from some really cool places. I mean, space is the coolest thing I've ever heard. Yeah, and I mean, it's certified space technology by the Space Foundation, which is the forward-facing arm that basically allows them to verify space technology, which because NASA will never do it. NASA, if someone says you can go to space, are you going? I would go in a heartbeat, yeah. I would go right away. Do you, like, know about space? Yeah, like, yeah. Like, what is it like? I mean, I've never been there. I can imagine based on movies, but... Usually they're wrong in the movies. but I know. That's what I'm saying. The movies, I feel like, are wrong. So as a scientist, is there anything that we like don't know about space that we haven't seen on movies? I feel like I'd get bored up there. You would get bored, and I f my negative would be like muscle atrophy, right? You're in zero gravity, so your muscles are basically oh. not doing anything, and you know they'll shrink. And you can run on the treadmill up there for as long as you want, but... That's for cardio. That's not necessarily. You know what there's I a treadmill to? in space? Yeah, they do exercise and stuff up there all the time. You know what I kind of correlated to? You know what there's people when they go on vacation and they get on a body of water and then they go on the back of the boat on the hang glider and they just get kind of dragged around? It sounds fun, but once you're up there, you're kind of just looking around. I don't know. Around. Space sounds kind of like relaxing. It's. I do my meditation to Joe Dispenza. I would need an activity up there. I would need to be like, we got to, you know, there's like a space. The only thing about space that always grossed me out is all the food's powder, right? Uh, no, they come in tubes and stuff like oh. that. You know, it's it's pretty nutritious stuff. There's a bunch of food scientists that work on that all the time. And what's so funny is people, the minute you think of space food, you think of like freeze-dried ice cream. Yes, why? But that never went to space. Wait, why do I think of freeze-dried ice cream? Because they sell it in museums. Yeah, they give right. it to us when you're a kid. <laughs> that's right. Oh, they gave that to us in school. Yeah. I wouldn't eat it, though. I thought Dippin' Dots were space food. No, I... I just feel like space food is like hospital food. It's like ugh. it's probably better than hospital food. I really? Mean, I I would go out on a limb and say, I'm sure it's not like hospital food. Hospital food's pretty bad. Our producer for sure wouldn't go to space. He only eats an orange chicken from Panda Express, and I don't think that they make that. In <laughs> they may make a, a dried form of that. You know, maybe a special request. Could you imagine being up there with him eating Panda Express? <laughs> but there's a version of hell that's real. That would be mine. <laughs> Where can everyone find you, ask you questions, find the brand? Yeah, so you can go right to our website, DeLaVSciences.com. You know, we, we sell online direct to consumers. You can, we post our clinical trial data up there so you could see all the evidence yourself. You could see the results from all the trials. Uh, you can learn about our products, read the ingredients, learn about bacillus lysate. And, you know, you could just reach out on the social media channels for the, the cosmetic company, and I'm around. You Can know. we do a giveaway or a code for the audience? Yeah, yeah, of course we could do a code for okay. the audience. What? Yeah. How much percentage off? So we'll, we could give 25% off for the code. Wow. That's a generous for the code. code skinny, yeah. yeah code could... skinny, 25% off, you guys. I'm actually going to go on there. I want to try this. I want to try everything in my own skincare and use it. And then can we do a little giveaway? Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay. Uh, tell us your favorite takeaway from this episode on my latest post at Lauren Bostick and make sure you're following what is your Instagram handle? Say it one more time. Uh, De La Vie Sciences. De La Vie Sciences. Merging skincare and science. Dr. Kyle, thank you so much for no coming problem. on. problem.